Thank you. And it's really like, it's a delight to see so many people I know and, and some new people too. Um, and I just like to thank um, Carolina and Alice for inviting me. And it's um, just a real pleasure to be able to share my work today. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen because obviously with textiles, you need a PowerPoint. So hopefully. All right. Can I assume you can all see? That's good. Super, okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. So let me begin with a cautionary tale. Scholars have sometimes argued that diplomatic exchange was the main source of silk in the Carolingian Empire. But diplomacy can only account for some of the silk found extant in Carolingian contexts or mentioned in early medieval documents. As demonstrated by a number of scholars in recent decades, the amount of silk available in the Carolingian world vastly exceeded the mentions of diplomatic gifts. Some must have arrived via trade or other forms of exchange. The impulse to argue that diplomacy was key to Silk's availability is understandable because it has let scholars connect certain textiles to particular moments or individuals. As appealing as such ties between existing textiles and documentary evidence are, they are only very rarely possible. Let us turn to one of the most famous of all Silks from a Carolingian context, the Mozak Hunter Silk. To explore the difficulties of linking cloth and text closely, and to advocate for a different approach, one that lets each source type provide a richer picture than either could on its own of Carolingian society's ties to cultures beyond its borders. As a number of texts attest, Byzantine emperors sometimes sent cloth to Frankish rulers. Robert de Michaud suggested that a silk, this one now housed in the Musée de Tissu in Lyon, may have been one such diplomatic gift. Two small pieces of the same silk also survive now in the Abeg Stiftung in Switzerland. That's the lower of the newer images and uh, the Bargello Museum in Florence. That's the one in the upper corner. All having been sold by the Church of St. Peter and Mozac, which was once the monastery of San Camin. The Mozac silk was therefore once larger than its remaining fragments would suggest on their own. It had long been associated with Pippin the Short. In 1197, the Bishop of Clermont verified the authenticity of the relics of St. Ostermann, first Bishop of the Auvergne. In so doing, he saw that the cloth wrapping them bore a seal of the Frankish King Pippin. Many assumed it referred to the first Carolingian King Pippin the Short, especially because a forged document credited him with the house's foundation. As a result, textile experts until quite recently often argued that he presented the cloth and relics to Mozak in 764. Only if one accepts that the mosaic silk was the original Carolingian wrapper for the relics and that it was then moved along with those relics from a Carolingian reliquary to a new one following the confirmation of 1197 can pass scholarly arguments that the mosaic silk either arrived in Carolingian lands in 756 or 757 with Byzantine envoys or was somehow tied to marriage negotiations between Pippin the Short and the Byzantine Emperor Constantine V seem comprehensible. Léon Le Villain demonstrated, however, that the Pippin named on the seal in the account of the relic verification was Pippin II of Aquitaine, so from the mid 9th century, not Pippin the Short. While Duchesne showed that Pippin II had the relics of Ostermann translated in 848, not 863, as Leveling had originally argued. Yet the evidence connecting the mosaic silk to Pippin II of Aquitaine is circumstantial at best. Building on the work of Levelaine, among others, Alain de Kien's compelling documentary study of evidence from the monastery of St. Peter, formerly saint Comin and Mosaic, throws doubt on any secure connection to a specific Carolingian ruler, even though the textile is not part of his article. Deerkins makes a strong case that the late 12th century account of the relic verification took place in a fraught context. In 1095, Robert II, Count of Auvergne, had given the monastery of Mozac to the Great House of Cluny, which caused ongoing conflict between both the Bishop of Clermont and Cluny and between Cluny and the monks of Mozac. It is out of that context that the verification of the relics took place in 1197, with the abbot of Mozac demanding that the Bishop of Clermont personally inspect the relics. Dierkin's evidence strongly suggests that this discussion of a seal of Pippin is less about an accurate accounting of an event and more about evoking a memory of the Carolingian past, substantiating a long history of the monastery, despite the fact that it only appears in written sources from the mid-9th century on, 
and signaling a shift in the house's perceived saint protector from Saint Ostermann to Saint Camin. Further supporting a later date are Sophie Desrosier and Karl Otowski's recent technical analyses of the silk fragments, which point to production in Constantinople in the first half of the 9th century, so not 8th century. The mosaic silk bears a motif common to many Byzantine and Islamic silks, a fact recognized by most scholars, even those who have argued um, that it is strictly a Byzantine piece. Despite a strong case that the mosaic silk is Byzantine in origin, it shared the motif of lion hunters with other textiles from Central Asia to the Carolingian court. The design then is not necessarily helpful to pinpointing the way the textile arrived in mosaic, even if it broadly reflects the Eurasian elite's love of hunting and horses. <clears throat> Although some like to note that no evidence indicates that the, that the relics silk cover was ever replaced, Nothing indicates that the cloth seen in the 12th century made its way into the 17th century reliquary from which the mosaic silk came, much less that the upheaval of the French Revolution did not confuse the identification before it was removed in 1904, so removed permanently from the reliquary at that point. In 1872, in his history of the monastery of Mosaic, Hippolyte Gaumont described the current state of the monastery's two remaining reliquaries and their contents. He noted that both were broken into during the French Revolution and their contents violated. Although the relics and some cloths were returned, the inability of anyone to then determine their authenticity meant that they were no longer venerated in the church. He discussed the remains of a, quote, very old cloth, unquote, wrapped around a leg bone, which had a design with four armed men on horses and four lions, indicating that the hunter's silk must have been larger than the three remaining parts together are now. In addition, he mentioned four straps that had once enveloped relics. The state of affairs may help to explain why the church was willing to sell their silks to museums, but it also underlines the fact that the hunter silk, although from a probable Carolingian context, cannot be connected with certainty to the 12th century description of the seal with the name Pippin that led people to associate it with Pippin the Short. Because it was purchased in 1904 from the Church of St. Peter in Mozak, the silk can be securely connected to a monastery that from the second half of the ninth century perpetuated a tradition connecting it to the Carolingian dynasty. It is not, however, the sole early medieval silk to come from Ozak. In 1905, from the same parish church, the Musée de Tissue in Lyon purchased two other fragments of a now badly damaged silk with an eagle motif, possibly dating to the ninth or 10th century, 10th, 10th or 10th centuries and fabricated in the area around Bukhara. Therefore, we cannot necessarily associate the mosaic silk with specific individuals or particular diplomatic accounts, or even with Carolingian rulers, because its only known context is the monastery's reliquaries. It can, however, suggest the kinds of silks that individuals in Carolingian lands saw, used, and sought from afar. I tell this cautionary tale in order to emphasize how extremely cautious one must be in trying to match up textual accounts and extant silks. Given the increasingly acknowledged difficulties of identifying the origins of many silks, I advocate for a more conservative approach. Setting the material and textual, textual evidence alongside one another can provide insights concerning the exchange and use of cloth across the borders of the Carolingian Empire, including showing the ways textiles connected Franks with distant lands, even if sometimes only in conceptual terms. Textiles were crucial components of early medieval social, political, and religious exchange that bound those living in the Carolingian world to one another. Their practical functions made them key components of the early medieval economy. Rich textiles affordable only to the early medieval elite circulated within and beyond the Carolingian empire, but have often left only fragmentary traces. I would say these are more sort of typical of what you might find in a, <laughs> in a museum rather than the mosaic silk, these very small kind of scraps. Um, so tracing the specific meanings and uses of luxury items across major political boundaries can illuminate the ways cloth bound those in the Car in Carolingian lands to those living beyond their borders. Early medieval rulers sent one another gifts, including textiles and clothing, either as part of diplomatic missions or along with letters. When Frankish kings sent these items, they meant to convey the power and wealth of their people to outsiders. Equally, other political leaders sent cloth gifts as means to impress and maintain ties with the Carolingians. The exchange of cloth and clothing as part of these embassies was so common that even fictional embassies drew on the practice, as shown by Anne Christie's. 
An easily portable and suitably lavish gift, cloth fed the competition and emulation among early medieval rulers, and its exchange provided sought after items to places that lacked them. The appetite for silk among the 9th century Carolingian elite appears to have been enormous. Silk served as key means of connecting the Carolingian world with the Abbasid Caliphate, the Byzantine Empire, Central Asian powers, and even China, though indirectly. Carolingian rulers passed fine cloths from these regions onto churches, monasteries, aristocratic followers, and other rulers such as Offa of Mercia and Harold the Dane. Those gifts integrated both insiders and outsiders into a sphere of Carolingian influence while acknowledging the high status of the recipients. Textiles play key roles in early medieval elite culture, whether they are aristocratic, whether Frankish or not. Examining a single form of material culture and its meanings provides a variety of ways to think about how contact and exchange with other political entities affected the most powerful early medieval empire north of the Alps. Although scholars have recognized that possession of rich textiles helped to identify an individual as aristocratic, the exchange of such items was equally if not more significant than the mere ownership of them. Luxury textiles and clothing were a form of material wealth that allowed the elite to engage in exchange with one another as a means to flaunt their wealth confirm their high status, and make bonds with their peers, inferiors, and betters. Investigating the significance of native cloth versus foreign textiles deepens understanding of the use and appreciation of textiles in Carolingian lands. Textiles comprise crucial gifts. Based on the attention they gave to internal gifts, one can assume that Carolingian rulers make conscious choices concerning the items they sent to Islamic rulers. Byzantine use of textiles and diplomatic exchange with the Carolingians has received more scholarly attention than similar Islamic use and is therefore perhaps more widely recognized and known. These objects provided means for early medieval leaders to make political and religious statements, yet the utility and desirability of silks helped to propel Western contact with the East. In sum, I argue that silk drove human actions. Embassies traveled between the Byzantine and Carolingian empires, as well as between the Abbasid Caliphate and the Frankish realm. The exchange of gifts and communication between the Byzantines and Franks rested greatly on their shared religion, despite their differences, and conscious understanding that they shared a Roman heritage. Diplomacy with Baghdad may have resulted from a common interest in keeping the Umayyad Emirate, based in Cordoba, relatively weak. The Abbasids saw it as a competitor, founded by the fleeing member of a family the Abbasids had violently wiped out after taking over the Caliphate in 751, while the Franks may have worried about, the, about Umayyad interference in their own affairs, especially in Aquitaine. In 798, King Alfonso of Galicia and Asturias sent a tent of astonishing beauty as a gift to Charlemagne. That the tent should arouse such admiration should come as no surprise given the long history of elaborately ornamented tents in the Near East. <clears throat> the elite in the Abbasid Caliphate used tents to delineate space both inside and outside. They often displayed hunting scenes related to a theme of paradise in Sustanian Persian tradition and included rich animal and vegetal decoration. And I'm about to put up a couple of slides of silks that show vegetal and animal decoration, just to give us an idea of what this could have looked like. Um, they often displayed hunting scenes related to a theme of paradise in Sustanian Persian tradition and included both rich animal and vegetal decoration. Early Byzantine and Coptic tents and curtains often had similar ornamentation related to a triumph of good over evil. Attestations of lavish tents with comparable decorations survive from 10th century Syria and 11th century Egypt. These sample silks may provide some indication of what the decoration looked like. So here we actually see um, a hunter, the backside of a hunter um, with the animals following and presumably there's another hunter in the circle um, of this rondel chasing, chasing those animals. Um, so in 807, Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid, the Abbasid Caliph, exchanged textiles through diplomatic missions. Harun al-Rashid sent rich linen cloths, a tent, and silk robes to Charlemagne. Charlemagne would certainly have appreciated the value of the cloths and robes that Harun al-Rashid sent. The seizure of war booty demonstrates the value of Islamic garments to the Franks. According to Armel the Black, after Louis and the Frankish forces conquered the city of Barcelona in 801, they brought Charlemagne various items as spoils of war, including clothing. In return, Charlemagne sent Frisian pallia, probably cloths, um, and because Frisian cloth was so highly prized in the early medieval world, Charlemagne probably believed that he was offering a worthy countergift. But it's impossible to know if the Caliph saw it quite that way, for his world included an abundance of silk unimaginable in the West. The Abbasid court was awash in luxurious textiles from carpets to rugs, mats to curtains, hangings to cushions. 
In his late ninth century Justicare Lee, Knocker the Stammerer mentions Charlemagne's countergift to Harun al-Rashid, noting that the white, gray, red, and blue Frisian cloths Charlemagne sent were rare and expensive in the Abbasid Caliphate. A sign that this may have been the case was the use of Frankish cloaks, very possibly made from Frisian cloth, to pay off the Islamic forces that in 869 had captured Archbishop Roland of Arles. Among the items agreed upon for his ransom were 150 cloaks. Harun al-Rashid, as F.W. Buckler pointed out, almost certainly thought that his gift of a robe conveyed great honor, but such a gift from an Abbasid caliph, especially one that he had worn upon his own body, also signified his overlordship in the Islamic world, no matter how rich the robe was. Harun al-Rashid may have therefore believed that Charlemagne, upon accepting the robe, had recognized him as the king of kings, an old Persian conception. The Christian emperor more probably saw himself as the caliph's equal. Although Charlemagne may have purposely chosen to ignore the insult or not entirely understood it as one, he also may not have been entirely unaware of the position Harun al-Rashid was trying to put him in, for Carolingian rulers also used cloaks or robes as gifts to individuals they viewed as subordinates or equals. The practice of employing textiles to signal subordination or friendship appears with some frequency in the early medieval world. Pope Leo IV sent back the pallium that Patriarch Ignatius of Constantinople sent him in 853. Accepting it would have implied that Rome relied upon Constantinople. The reverse understanding differed. In 879 or 880, Pope John VIII sent a pallium along with a tunic, chasuble, and sandals to Patriarch Photius in recognition of their connection to one another. The Patriarch accepted these gifts, probably understanding them as a sign of a mutual bond. Diplomatic items of note were often those that the Franks found costly, unusual, and or distinctly foreign. Abbasid gifts of purple and red dyes from Tyre and Iberia, respectively, in 807 allowed those at Charlemagne's court to dye locally produced textiles. In 864, the Emir in Cordoba sent an embassy to Charles the Bald bearing gifts, including tents, covers, and cloths of diverse origin, which arrived at the court in 865. <clears throat> The fact that these men from across the Pyrenees also brought camels and their different substances underlines the exotic nature of the items and suggests that te the textiles may well have originated from further afield in Cordoba. This exchange of items from one culture to the next probably increased both the economic and perceived social value of the textiles in question. Gifts of textiles were among the most effective royal tools. Knocker discussed cloth, oh, sorry, Knocker discussed cloaks of Frisian cloth when he listed the many presents of clothing that Louis the Pious, Charlemagne's son, made. He did so in order to underline the king's piety, offering a moral lesson to Charles the Fat, the intended recipient of the work. Yet earlier in contemporary cases of royal provision of clothing and cloths suggest that this portrait relied upon the expected actions of a king. The papacy and the Carolingians engaged in textile exchange with one another rather frequently. One might expect that the papacy always had the upper hand in terms of its access to rich textile items, given its proximity to Mediterranean trade, but appearances may be deceiving. The many lavish textiles described in the Liber Pontificalis during the era of the Carolingian popes suggest the immense textile wealth of the papacy. Um, and here's an example of um, a silk from this period found in the uh, in the Vatican, so um, that area is now in the Vatican Museum. Yet by the mid 9th century, that quantity and the quality of textiles mentioned in the Liber Pontificalis decrease. Such a diminution may relate to the weakening of the Frankish Papal Alliance and a more precarious situation for late 9th century popes. At the same time, the Carolingians ability to acquire silk for church use appeared anything but, dis but diminished. The Franks may have had better access to silk during those decades than earlier. In 758, Pepin the Short sent a cloth in which his baby daughter Gisela had been wrapped at baptism to Pope Paul I so that the Pope could consider himself her godfather. In the poem King Charles and Pope Leo, the poet describes how upon his reception by Charlemagne and his court of Paderborn, Pope Leo marveled at the many people from different lands with diverse tongues, clothing, and weapons. Ermold the Black described the rich gifts that Pope Stephen gave to Louis and his wife Judith in 816, which included clothing. In return, Louis gave him red garments or cloths, white linens, and two dyed cloaks, quote, highly suitable coverings for the body, which were in the Frankish style, unquote. Queens were primary providers of textile gifts, an important aspect of their role in the running of the household and control of gifts. A mid-9th century poem, 
John's goddess Eriugena, yeah, or sorry, in a mid ninth century poem, John's goddess Eriugena discussed a robe fabricated by Queen Judith and finished by Queen Ermintrude. This project spanned generations, showing how cloth and textile work gave queens a role in creating connections beyond the empire's borders. According to its dedicatory verses, which Eriugena composed, Ermintrude finished the robe for donation to a Roman church dedicated to the Apostle Paul during the reign of Pope Nicholas I. Her mother-in-law, Judith, had dec originally decorated the same robe for Louis the Pious. In letters of 864 and 865, Nicholas thanked Ermintrude for some gifts, noting in one his pleasure in her virtuous labor, implying that she had made the gifts. While these mentions conveyed the ideal of female domestic virtue and confirmed that the ruler kept order in his own household, they support other evidence that elite women could make textile items that allowed them to influence arenas normally off limits to them. In 870, Charles the Bald sent an altar cloth made from his own golden clothing to Rome for the altar of St. Peter, which suggests a possible use for the robe fabricated by Judith and Ermintrude. The papacy sometimes sent the Carolingians textiles, at the Synod of Pontheon in summer 876, Charles and his wife Achildus received papal envoys and letters. The next day, she accepted a papal gift of pallia and jewel encrusted armlets. Pallia could refer to either cloths or robes, but regardless of the form, these textiles were doubtless rich gifts meant as a compliment to the queen, as much as a reminder of the papacy's access to wealth. Texts further recount movement of cloth between early medieval leaders. The Carolingians sent textiles to the Kingdom of Mercia in the wake of a trade dispute. A mutual embargo between Charlemagne and Offa of Mercia that allegedly began around 790 would have been, as Olivier Bruin has noted, a double-edged sword because it cut the Carolingian Empire off from desirable trade goods, including fabric from Ireland and England, even as it deprived Offa's people of items they wanted from the continent. By the mid-790s, Abbot Gervold of saint Drill had played a key role in getting trade started again. A lot was at stake for him because his monastery collected tolls along the coast of the English Channel. Remaining documents may not provide a complete or accurate account of these events, but they do indicate the critical role that exchange of textiles played in the relationship between Mercia and the Carolingian Empire. In 796, in a letter that seems to have aimed to emphasize an alliance between the two despite their recent troubles with one another, Charlemagne sent Offa, King of Mercia, a belt along with a Hunnish sword and two silk cloths, and noted that he had provided Dalmatics and Pallia to the 15 bishops of Mercia and Northumbria. These particular objects underline the power and wealth of Charlemagne's court, demonstrating to Offa and his court in a palpable form, Frankish power and access to expensive goods from distant lands. During that same year, Charlemagne's fourth wife, Lutgard, donated a textile to a Mercian religious house. Alcuin wrote in a letter to Ethelberga, abbess of Fladbury in Worcestershire, Lutgard, Lutgard, also a noblewoman, has sent you the small gift of a cloth, a pallium. Regard her as a sister in the love of God. This present from the queen to the Mercian abbess may have been a garment for Ethelberga's personal use, but it seems more likely to have been a cloth or even altar cloth. Ethelberga's sisters of Fladbury may well have seen this pallium and known of its royal Frankish origins. In 824, the Byzantine Emperor Michael II sent Louis the Pious 10 precious cloths. His accompanying letter specified the cloth types, identifying most by color, quote, one leek green cloth, one quince yellow cloth, two Tyrian cloths, two true purple cloths, two rose colored cloths, and two pieces of cloth, unquote. Some or all were of silk. These items could have displayed could have provided a wonderful display of court when presented by the emperor's legates, and they would have flaunted the wealth of the East. Numerous church inventories list six silk items. Given our time constraints today, a few examples will have to suffice to indicate the range of places in Carolingian lands that had silk items, many of which would have been visible to those worshiping in the churches, and to suggest the large quantity of such items in ninth century churches. I'm just gonna restrict myself to a sample of ninth century inventories. So the monastery at Staffelse listed some silk items in an inventory from 811. They included an embroidery of silk, 20 altar cloths decorated with silk, 13 silk liturgical cloths for use at the altar, eight pairs of silk gloves, four of which were decorated with golden pearls, and one silk cloth whose use is not indicated. Among the possessions listed in inventory of 838.40 for the Cathedral of Würzburg were two silk relic covers, eight silk altar cloths, five silk liturgical cloths, four silk chasubles, and 12 pairs of silk gloves. 
According to its 842 inventory, the parish church at Biberac near Dachau had 10 silk cloths. A mid 9th century inventory survives from the great monastery of Reichenau, which included among its many textiles, a Greek or Byzantine linen altar cloth interwoven with silk, as well as two further ones with gold decorations. Such a designation is no guarantee of the stated origin. The attribution could have served as shorthand for silk of a certain style, but it indicates an understanding that some items came from foreign lands, a characteristic worthy of note in a document that provided relatively few details. The monastery had further items that did not indicate an origin. A blue linen altar cloth decorated with silk, three good silk liturgical cloths, and two silk vestments. Some of the chapel inventories listed in the late 9th or early 10th century breviara of the convent of San Salvador in Brescia list silk items, two list silk, or sorry, two list Syrian cloths. An inventory of the parish church of Mauern by Freising survives in a list from the time of Bishop Waldo of Freising, um, who was active in the late 9th century. It included four silk pallia, a silk chasuble among its relatively modest listing of textiles. An inventory dated to 886 from the chapel of Philip associated with the monastery of Prum listed a green silk chasuble, the only textile listed aside from some liturgical towels. Among the precious textiles, some adorned with gold and one with gems that the suffragan Bishop Madeline gave to Bishop Burkhard of Passau in 903 was a chasuble of purple silk. In 908, in addition to other textiles, Bishop Adalbero of Augsburg gave the monastery of St. Gall costly purple cloth from Tyre. When the West Frankish king Odo removed items from Saint Denis in 888, they included pallia that sound a lot like those found among the silks and church treasuries elsewhere. A white pallium with small golden birds, a scarlet one with elephants, a purple one with griffins, and a bright green one with peacocks. The will of Bishop Rikolf of Elm noted that two of the pallia that he left for use in his church were from Byzantine lands, and one was in the Greek style. So these are just a, an, a, it's a long list of things I just uh, stated there, but this is just a small sample. There are many, many more of these items listed in inventories that we know about. But we also know that the, there are numerous pattern silks that survive. And these pattern silks, they made their way into Carolingian reliquaries where they've survived to this day. And it's these items that can provide some sense of the appearance of these textiles from beyond the borders of the Carolingian empire. And I'm just going to note very quickly that I decided it would be very foolish of me to try to put up a picture of every single textile I'm going to mention. <laughs> um, and that some, the pictures are just not that great. Um, and that the pictures, all the ones I'll show, they just, uh, it's important to know they don't reflect how beautiful these items actually are and, and their true colors and what they look like. So you're just getting a kind of an approximation. Um, so Anna Muthesius um, has estimated that more than 1,000 such silks dated prior to 1200 remain. Most scholars now recognize that silk arrived mainly as a trade good, um, though one beyond the financial reach of the vast majority of individuals living in the Carolingian Empire. A lot of silk made its way north from the Alps, or, sorry, made its way north of the Alps from the Mediterranean. Although the vast majority of silk in Italy and in Frankish lands in the 8th and 9th centuries must have arrived through trade, these, those items that arrived via diplomatic relations were probably more consistently high quality pieces. Trade constituted, however, an important means of bringing textiles into Carolingian lands, and Carolingian um, uh, people exported linen and wool to other regions. So the regions of Flanders and the Artois, for example, both saw the export of linen and wool during the Carolingian era, and English textiles came into Frankish lands. A rich source of silk in the 8th and 9th centuries was the Byzantine Empire, which cultivated ties and trade with Italy. Silks also came from the Abbasid Caliphate. Theodulf of Orléans described the arrival of cloths of varying color brought to Arles by Arabs. It is doubtful that as many silks originated in Umayyad Iberia as elsewhere in the Islamic world, given the comparatively sparse evidence for silk manufacture there compared to the Eastern Mediterranean, but some probably did arrive via that route. Some Central Asian silks made their way to Frankish hands, most probably through the Mediterranean. And there are some silks that would have made their way south from Scandinavia um, by a trade um, through um, the lands of the Rus. So identifying the arrival method of specific silk pieces is quite difficult. A silk that was once housed in St. Servadius in Maastricht, but is now in Berlin, appears to be an imitation of Byzantine imperial lion silk. 
that it and a great many other Central Asian silks ended up in the Mas region suggests both trade between these two areas from the 7th to 10th or 11th centuries and exchange among the Byzantine Western and Central Asian worlds. Another problem with identifying the origin of a piece is that thread could originate in one location, be dyed in another and woven in yet a third place. What exactly then constitutes the origin of such pieces? My focus on items with probable or confirmed Carolingian context helps in that I am most concerned with a cloth's destination. But to measure the degree of exchange with those beyond Carolingian borders requires some effort to understand possible locations of production. When identifiable, those origins varied. Sophie de Rossier has argued that a brightly colored silk, uh, but worn silk now in Paris came from Central Asia in the eighth or ninth century. These silks had first and foremost to serve their local markets. 10th century textual evidence indicates that many in the early Islamic world enjoyed textiles that had recognizable images of animals, especially elephants, birds, lions, horses, and camels, and objects like goblets. A linen and wool multicolored medallion from 8th or 9th century Egypt in the Herzog Anton Ulrich Museum in Braunschweig, Germany, shows facing lions and underlines the appearance of such motifs in a variety of media in the Islamic world. Such images appeared on rugs, not only silks. Chinese silks rarely survive in early medieval Western European contexts, but those did, that did also likely arrive by a trade. Other silks connected the Carolingian and Mediterranean worlds and reflected shared appreciation for the classical past. In Berlin, Lyon, Manchester, New York, and Paris are fragments of the so-called Dieu's Curry silk, probably of 8th century Byzantine origin, which on a red background has rondelles containing two military figures atop columns with bulls skulls at their bases, winged genie pouring coins from bags and kneeling men sacrificing bulls. Scholars have identified the two main figures as Romulus and Remus and or Castor and Pollux, the Dios Curi, who were patrons of the Constantinople Hippodrome. The coins may reference the practice of distributing money to audiences at the Hippodrome. Because of the textile's provenance, Hero Granger Taylor has suggested as possible donors, Charles Martel, Charlemagne, and Bishop Bernard of Worms, who gave a pallium to St. Servatius in 826. But the original larger textile of which these pieces were once part was found in a 12th century reliquary of Saint Servatius in 1863. Franz Bach sold their fragments in Lyon and Manchester and therefore likely removed all the surviving pieces from Maastricht in order to market them. Nevertheless, we know that 9th century individuals chose to use silks depicting quadrigas, which came from both Byzantine and Syrian ateliers to envelop relics. Two 8th century red pieces of silk with a repeating motif of a triumphant quadriga driver were found at Munsterbilsen in Belgium in two reliquaries, including a 9th century one for St. Amour. It resembles another, probably more famous, charioteer silk with fragments in Paris, uh, Aachen, and Florence, which shares with the Deuce Curry silk a visual reference to money distribution at the Hippodrome in the form of two figures dispensing coins below the charioteer. Similarly, those choosing relic wrapping selected ones with animals. I'm just going to highlight for you uh, two animals. One is birds, and so they chose these birds as a motif pretty, pretty frequently. From the collection of the Convent of Fermutier came an 8th or 9th century beige Samite fragment that included fragmentary figures of birds, probably ducks. It resembles some silks found in the treasury of St. Lambert in Liège, which date to the 8th or 9th century and are probably from Persia. An 8th or 9th century Central Asian polychrome silk with ducks facing one another in rondelles, now in Paris, originally enveloped the relics of Saint Regnabert in a church of Saint Saturn de Vergy in the Côte d'Or, according to some surviving documentation. A 7th to 10th century Byzantine or Persian red silk fragment depicting a duck turned up in the 1865 discovery of 24 early medieval relic wrappings at the Cathedral of Wachen. Another silk from this group had a design of pairs of ducks on a yellow background. Ducks comprise the central design of another 7th or 8th century Persian or 10th century Byzantine red silk wrapping from Aachen. They face one another in pairs standing on the leaves of trees. Also among these Aachen fragments is a silk with pairs of peacocks, columns, and eight pointed stars on a dark blue background that may be from 6th century Egypt or 10th century Byzantium, and a red fragment with white facing guinea fowls in medallions from either the 6th or 10th centuries, and that's, that's what you see here. Um, 
A more elaborate guinea fowl motif appears on a 9th century red Egyptian silk relic wrapping found at Saint Maurice in Switzerland, which shows two yellow, green, and red guinea fowl turned away from the stylized tree that stands between them. In the reserves of the Bruges House Museum in Bruges are small faded fragments of an 8th century silk with a pattern of facing peacocks. In the stash of silk relic wrappings found at the Cathedral of Sion in Switzerland was a 9th century Byzantine or Syrian blue fragment that includes amidst foliage two blue birds with outstretched wings on either side of a green bird bent over pecking at the ground. A 9th or 10th century blue Persian silk depicting birds was found in the reliquary of Saint Benin at the monastery of Saint Benin in Dijon in 1792. Elephants were also a source of fascination to the Carolingian elite and were also popular on uh, silks from this period. The Physiologus, um, the text about um, the nature of animals, explained that the natural virtue of elephant mates made them comparable to Adam and Eve before the fall. The Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid complied with Charlemagne's request for an elephant, sending him one from India in 802. Abu Labaz, as he was known, survived until 810 when he died on campaign to Denmark. While at court, he served as a visible reminder of the East, much like silks that made an impression on those who saw him. Silks with elephant motifs survive in various places, including St. Tron, where fragments of at least three 6th to 8th century silks remain in its church. An inventory of this monastery's treasures from 870 indicates its vast wealth and the extant fragments provide a means to envision the luxurious nature of some of the many dalmatics, chasubles, altar cloths, and other vestments and textiles, including silk, that appear in the inventory. Also at Centron is this uh, stunning relic bag, it's more stunning in person, <laughs> made from 9th or 10th century Byzantine silk with a motif of elephants and therefore analogous to a 10th century silk of Maastricht. Facing pairs of elephants grace a 9th century silk, which survives at Liège in two pieces. The widespread use of this motif means it could be Central Asian, Byzantine, or Iranian in origin. A 9th or 10th century Byzantine silk, now in the collection of Dunbar and Oaks in Washington, D.C., depicts an elephant tamer who grasps two elephant trunks. It resembles a silk from the convent of Munsterbilsen. Found also in the reliquary of Sir Saint Amour, who lived during the 9th century, were eight fragments of 7th to 8th century silk depicting facing tigers, a rare early medieval textile motif. In 1982, six were sewn together. Not all cloth used in churches and monasteries in association with relics were silk. Among the textiles understood to be relics from the eras of Pippin the Short and Charlemagne is a large linen cloth decorated with two attached linen bands, which may have been or been meant to resemble a shroud, found around the turn of the 20th century with other textiles in a silk covered box. Accompanying it was a 9th century tag that indicated that Pippin had ordered that the relics be placed in the box. From inventories and other textual accounts, it is clear that Carolingian clerics used cloths of native production alongside silk items. These items were sometimes extraordinary in their own right, such as an early medieval linen brocaded cloth in the cathedral treasury at Sens that shows a scene of the Assumption and may constitute one of the oldest depictions of that scene. But, and this is actually a very difficult text I'll discuss because there's very few, um, perhaps no um, comparable um, remaining ones like it. So it's, it's, it's um, dated if you're curious on the basis of um, two of the letters um, in the inscription. But most were relatively humble, such as the linen cloths mentioned in the correspondence of priests, monks, and nuns, or the many linen items um, listed in church and monastic inventories. Silk's coexistence with other cloths also helped to accentuate its luxurious and singular nature. The detail of its motifs, its sheen, its supple nature, and its drapes set it apart from other more widely available materials of linen and wool. Two of the most spectacular survivals from the Carolingian era in the Cathedral Treasury at Sens, which is one of the largest um, collections of Carolingian era textiles, um, are one certainly Islamic silk and the other a possibly Islamic, but perhaps Byzantine one heavily influenced by Eastern motifs. The first is the silk of St. Victor shown here, a piece attributed by many to 9th century Byzantium, although Felix Guichet makes a strong case for 7th to 9th century Persia. It shows a man with long stylized hair holding two lions with two lions at his feet surrounded by a pearled rondelle. This is a, a detail. 
Willikar, abbot of Saint-Avon in present-day Switzerland, brought the relics of Saint Victor to Sens in 769 when he became Archbishop of Sens. The monastery had allegedly been raised at the site of Victor's martyrdom in late antiquity. According to legend, Victor had been martyred with the Theban Legion in the third century. Based on the date of the textile, most experts believe it came to envelop these relics at the time of their translation to Sens. The silk was removed from its relics in 1850. Some have thought this image must have appealed to Christians because they thought it was Daniel in the lion's den. Others once suggested an association with Samson or Hercules. We know, however, that this motif drew from Persian ones that depicted Gilgamesh fighting off lions. Even those who have argued that it is a Byzantine piece believe it to be a copy of that older Persian motif. Silk patterns across Eurasia may have referenced the constellations and had astral meanings. Red and blue backgrounds had astral associations in China. Han Dynasty and Tang Dynasty silks often referred to specific constellations. Samson silks, understood as Hercules silks, and Deuce Cree silks um, may also have had similar associations with the stars. It is therefore possible that this silk reflects longstanding Carolingian interest in astronomy. The other stunning example of certainly Islamic origin are the silks of St. Columba and Lupus. Columba had been a virgin martyr and St. Lupus had served as Archbishop of Sens and died in 623. Unusually, these silks were associated with relics whose translation was recorded in 853, dating the use of these textiles to that era. Initially, scholars believe this piece to be Byzantine, but based on a Persian motif. Scholarly consensus changed, however, on the basis of the weave and thread in addition to the design and survival of comparable Persian pieces. It is now more firmly dated to 8th or 9th century Persia. In seven rows of four oval medallions, two lions face one another across a shrub. This motif draws from old Persian ideas of the tree of life. Between the medallions are pairs of foxes and dogs running separated by shrubs. Until the French Revolution, this textile sat enveloping its relics in the church of the monastery of St. Columba in Sens, now destroyed. In 853, Archbishop Wendell of Sens had presided over the consecration of the monastery's church and overseen the translation of the relics of Columba and Lupus. Almost certainly, this was the moment when this 8th or 9th century silk was cut in two to wrap the relics, providing them a terminus antiquum of the mid 9th century. When the two reliquaries were opened in the 19th century, Columba in 1879 and Lupus in 1896, church leaders discovered that each contained a piece of the same textile in roughly the same dimensions, and they made a decision in 1896 to reconstitute the piece. The division of this silk suggests a possible Carolingian practice, the purposeful slicing up of silk to cover relics. So this suggests that the relic wrappings were not always just sort of leftovers. They may actually have been um, cut to size in some cases. A number of silks resemble the lion silk, lion silk associated with the relics of Columba and Lupus and Sens. Among them is a silk now in Nancy in the Museum of Lorraine, which was associated with the relics of Bishop Amon of Toul, which were translated in 820, almost certainly the time when the silk was used to envelop his relics. And you can see um, between the medallions, there's stylized shrubs and, and dogs um, running two by two, while within the medallions, the facing lions have a shrub between them. The silk displays telltale signs of Persian fabrication. <clears throat> also associated with Saint Amon was a ninth or sorry, eighth or ninth century Byzantine silk showing a man wrestling with a bull. Clearly the relics of Amon, like the, the relics of Sens, merited impressive silk wrappings. Both the silk of Columba and Lupus and the Nancy textile show lions, showing lions resemble a contemporary silk found in the treasury of Wee in Belgium, once associated with the relics of Mangold. Other comparable Persian lion textiles survive in Brussels, Liège, and Nuremberg, among other locations, as do many fragments, not least in Shell and Maastricht. Another comparable fragment um, survived at Baromunster in Switzerland, where a church of St. Stephen had been founded in 876 which Charles the Simple and Emma, widow of Louis the German, named as its benefactors, and where Count Barrow founded a monastery attached to that church in 922. The popularity then of this motif over time and its use across a range of Carolingian locales suggests a strong appeal to the Carolingian elite. On one level, the items in the treasuries let us imagine far more clearly what items that came into the Carolingian court look like. They also give us an opportunity to think about why individuals in the Carolinian world may have chosen uh, some of these textiles with certain motifs to act as relic wrappings. 
They further suggest how rich and exotic these textile items must have seemed, and yet perhaps also familiar given the range of silks that survive in treasuries. These silks should remind us that the world of the Carolingian elite was one that included foreign pattern textiles, and that such silks became physical reminders of the connections among the Byzantine, Islamic, and Frankish worlds. When one saw an Islamic silk in the Carolingian court or in a Frankish church, it emphasized the wealth and importance of these places, but also may have served to make individuals think of the far places from which the textiles came. Given the use of common motifs across the Eastern Mediterranean and into Persia and the challenges that modern textile conservators face in pinpointing the origins of a single silk cloth, it is highly unlikely that individuals in the Carolingian world could discern the exact origin of the silks they saw. These textiles muddy the demarcation between Christian and Islamic and among Byzantine Abbasid and Central Asian that we find in early medieval texts and in present scholarship. Additionally, they bring Frankish aristocrats, ecclesiastical leaders, and rulers into a broader Eurasian elite that employed silk to demarcate status and power and allow a glimpse of the ways the Carolingian world resembled other early medieval cultures. Yet no one in Carolingian lands could manufacture silk thread. A desire for silk surely helped to turn the Franks' attention outward, to look beyond their borders for a highly prized item and to see contact with those who had it in abundance. Thank you.